Hello, and thank you for joining us in this fireside chat to discuss the implications of current sanctions on global supply chains. I'm Snijana Gebauer, a partner at StoneTurn, um, a leading global risk advisory firm. I advise leaders in business, finance, and government uh, on risk management strategies, investigations, and various compliance matters. Uh, throughout my career, and especially over the last uh, several months, I have assisted clients with it identifying and mitigating uh, sanction risks across supply chain, investor bases, and partnerships. And as such, I am excited to introduce my guest for this discussion on sanctions, Mr. Marshall Billingsley. Marshall is the former Assistant Secretary for Terrorist Financing at the Department of the Treasury. He led U.S. efforts to counter illicit, finance, illicit financial activities globally and has traveled to and worked with more than 100 countries around the world. Marshall also has served as the Special Presidential Envoy for Arms Control at the U.S. Department of State and as President of the Financial Action Task Force, FATF. He is currently a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and focuses on illicit finance and arms control with the Kleptocracy Initiative. Thank you for joining me today, Marshall. Okay, let's get right into it. Um, it has now been more than 16 weeks since the sweeping economic sanctions against Russia came into effect. Many hoped um, that there would be an economic collapse that would change President Vladimir Putin's mind on his invasion um, of Ukraine. However, that has not happened and the conflict continues today. Um, some would argue that, um, that, that Russia is already used to economic sanctions. Um, there, the country has been sanctioned um, on an incremental basis since 2014. And others um, have made arguments that while economic sanctions as a foreign policy tool can be effective with smaller nations, they're not as effective with superpowers. Um, so let me ask you the question that's on everybody's mind. Are the sanctions against Russia working? And to the extent that Russia is weathering the storm, why is that? Well, let me start by accentuating the positive here, which is to say <clears throat> that uh, there's been an unprecedented global uh, reaction to Russia's attack on Ukraine. And the European Union has imposed six rounds of sanctions. Uh, and the United Kingdom has actively used its new sanction statutes uh, to great effect, I believe, uh, and has in many cases led the way on the imposition of sanctions as a response. Uh, we've also seen many Asian nations uh, engage in parallel activities, whether we're talking about Japan or Australia or even Singapore, and Taiwan. Uh, so there has been worldwide condemnation and worldwide economic pressure put on Vladimir Putin for his aggression. I think the Biden administration deserves uh, credit for, for how they have worked with these various nations and various blocs uh, to maintain that pressure. Uh, but of course, first and foremost, uh, credit goes to uh, Ukraine's president, Zelensky, and his foreign minister, uh, who have proven incredibly capable at using social media and every imaginable diplomatic opportunity to highlight Russian atrocities against the Ukrainian people and to continue to press for uh, more and stronger sanctions than we currently have in place. So the short answer is um, there has been a global response and that's incredibly positive. I think the longer answer is that there are significant gaps in the sanctions that have been imposed to date. And that is why Russia is weathering the storm. Okay. Well, what can we expect in the next six to 12 months with respect to Russia and, and possibly China? Um, will sanctions intensify? I think so. Uh, obviously the war is grinding on and Russia is making incremental advances uh, in Eastern Ukraine, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and I hope that the Biden administration in particular will begin to plug the significant gaps in the sanctions uh, regime that it's enacted. Uh, if one only looks at the playbook that we established with both Iran and Venezuela, you can quickly see that the sanctions on the Russian financial sector uh, have been uh, really piecemeal. Uh, the Russian central bank itself is not yet sanctioned, nor are many of the Russian banks in which the Russian government continues to maintain controlling shares. Uh, 
Uh, many of the Russian banks remain connected to the SWIFT network. Uh, and of course, the Biden administration undercut the effectiveness of its own financial sanctions by issuing General License 8A, now General License 8C, which despite sanctions allows uh, continued transactions with all these Russian banks as long as it's for purchasing energy. And of course, that's the other big deficiency in the sanctions regime. While the United States has stopped buying Russian energy, the European Union continues to, uh, to the tune of roughly a billion dollars a day that is lining uh, the Russian central bank's war coffers and enabling them to continue this war of aggression. The, let, let's talk a little bit about the the impact that the sanctions, the Russian sanctions, have had on global trade and supply chains. Um, they, in some ways, um, the the sweeping sanctions have been described um, to um, as similar as resembling to those imposed against Japan and Italy in the 1930s. Um, but unlike these two countries, Russia is a major exporter of oil, grain, and many other commodities. And also, unlike the 1930s, the global economy is far more integrated today. Um, so as a result, the, the, the global economic, the sanctions have had more profound impact um, on, um, on, on global trade and, and, and global supply chains. Moreover, there's been a development, an unexpected development, where many uh, Western companies um, have taken voluntary steps to suspend their activities um, in Russia or have completely withdrawn from Russia, sometimes at a very considerable cost um, to themselves. And this self-sanctioning effectively has also impacted global trade and, and, and global supply chains. Um, and then finally, there is a, there's a concern that um, economic sanctions um, are having a bit of a boomerang effect, that rather than dissuading the Kremlin as, as, as intended, they are instead exacerbating inflation, they're worsening um, inventory shortages, and they're destabilizing the markets. Um, what have been the unintended consequences of the Russia sanctions, especially as they relate to, to global trade and, and supply chains? And, and, and has there been this boomerang effect? Well, that's a great question. Uh, let's start with <clears throat> the intended consequences, which have not materialized because of the various loopholes. Um, you know, if you, if you engage in half measures, you're going to get uh, half results. Uh, and what we see now is a Russia with a ruble that is at a seven-year high. Uh, we see a Russia that is running a $110 billion trade surplus. Russian export prices are 60% higher this year than they were last year. Uh, inflation, it's, it's high in Russia to be sure, but it is actually dropping, unlike here in the United States where it's going up. It dropped from 17.8% to 17.1% in May. And the central bank is able now to begin reducing a lot of its capital controls uh, because they have effectively been able to exploit these various loopholes and the continued energy purchases to blunt the financial and economic impacts. Uh, now that said, um, the, there still is opportunity for the Biden administration to plug these gaps, to authorize the Treasury to impose secondary sanctions on countries that continue uh, to buy, in particular, Russian oil and gas. And that is actually crucial at this stage. We've seen in the case of China, Chinese imports are up 55% year over year uh, from Russia. And India has already bought five times as much oil this year, to date this year, as they did last year. So those secondary sanctions also become noteworthy in their absence. Uh, you know, there has been the suggestion that uh, Putin is to blame for inflation. That's certainly not the case here in the United States. Inflation had started to spike in October of this past year, long before the invasion. And in fact, prior to uh, the February 24th attack, uh, inflation was almost 8% already. Uh, so it's at 8.6% now. So you really can't uh, lay that at Russia's feet here in the United States. There are other underlying uh, factors that are driving uh, those inflationary pressures, at least in the United States. But I do think in terms of boomerang effect or effects that we uh, still have not yet seen that we should be greatly concerned by, uh, in particular deal with food supply. Uh, these are not affected by sanctions. They're affected by Russia's blockade of Odessa in the Black Sea and Russian pillaging of grain uh, supplies 
in Ukraine. And as a result, we're going to see significant food shortages in the Middle East and North Africa, who have been traditionally very dependent upon Ukraine as a breadbasket for those food supplies. Uh, there's also been an effect, as you mentioned, with these so-called self-sanctioning, but there has been a noteworthy effect on the pullout by the big multinational companies from Russia. Now, here we're talking about uh, companies like McDonald's or Starbucks or Apple, uh, and that has uh, left the Russian people without a large, uh, without access to a lot of Western uh, commodities that they are used to typically. But we're already seeing, just as we are with China and India on the export substitution, we're seeing Russia begin to try to engage in import substitution to replace those kinds of commodities, knock off products, illicit importation, uh, switching over to, to Chinese sources of supply and so on. So again, uh, unless we continue to ramp up the pressure, uh, the Russian central bank and the Russian authorities have proven that they know how to blunt the effectiveness of these measures. Sanctions will work as long as we're committed to significantly imposing them on the Russian regime. Marshall, could there have been any measures that uh, could have been taken to soften the impact of these you know, unintended consequences? Yes. Well, I mean, look, if you, if you go back to a decade ago, if the German government had not made itself rough basically energy hostage, energy dependent upon the Russians, we'd be in a far different place. Uh, likewise, if the precipitous shutdown of nuclear power plants across Europe had not occurred, uh, likewise, we, we would be in a much better uh, position to uh, begin canceling these various oil and gas contracts, uh, which are still ongoing today, unfortunately. Uh, here in the United States, there have been a number of unfortunate decisions regarding drilling and leasing and regulatory red tape uh, surrounding energy production that also have exacerbated the problem. Uh, but these are domestic, uh, political, and economic uh, decisions uh, which have been made, uh, and now we're grappling with the consequences. Uh, but that said, the longer we continue to buy energy from Russia, the longer the war in Ukraine will continue. Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about compliance with, uh, with sanctions and the challenges that, that companies are facing. Um, in, in, in recent months, as, as risk and compliance consultants, we've been handling significant number of inquiries regarding sanctions. They obviously rolled out quickly and, and caught many businesses around the world um, unprepared. Companies had to quickly determine if they had investors that are now sanctioned, um, if they've invested in, in or partner up with companies that might ultimately be controlled by now sanctioned entities or individuals, or if their customers now might be sanctioned. Um, the, the sanction analysis um, contains several key complexities. Um, one, it is increasingly difficult to determine whether an entity is controlled by a Russian oligarch or a kleptocrat, um, as they prefer to conceal their ownership through layers of offshore companies and, and proxies. Um, determining whether or not there's sanction exposure requires more uh, in-depth uh, research and, and diligent analysis. Um, another complexity uh, is introduced by the sectoral sanctions. Um, they require very careful interpretation and review of the guidelines and applying potentially a narrow or a technical interpretation of sectoral sanctions can be perceived as, as, as evasion. Um, and then thirdly, the, the, the sanction analysis, exposure analysis becomes more complex when companies are, are working on being compliant with sanctions globally in addition to, to U.S. sanctions um, and, and, and including those that have been imposed by the European Union and, and other countries. Um, and you mentioned secondary sanctions earlier. If you add them to the mix, the landscape becomes even more challenging. Um, from your experience at Treasury, what are OFAC's expectations of, of companies on, on sanction compliance? Um, how far does OFAC expect companies to go in determining potential exposure? Well, I, I think you know the, the Treasury Department writ large, of which OFAC is is a part, um, you know, expects compliance with uh, U.S. sanctions, uh, both those imposed by the executive branch as well as those that are statutorily enacted by Congress. Uh, because remember, in addition to the most recent sanctions. You have other sanctions, executive branch uh, executive orders dating back to 2014, 
And then you have uh, additional layers of sanctions that have been imposed over time by various laws that have been enacted. So it can be daunting uh, because of the wide range of measures that exist. Uh, one has only to think about the sanctions that were imposed, for instance, for the chemical weapons attacks that were conducted by Russia and against Sergei Skripal first, and then against uh, Navalny, uh, the opposition leader, later. Uh, so those are additional measures that are on the books. And as you mentioned, on top of it, you have uh, you don't have perfect overlay between the U.S. measures and what the U.K. and the EU have done. So this does make it quite complicated for companies. On top of that, uh, you're dealing with oligarchs and kleptocrats who've had decades to think through how to best obfuscate and hide their money. And so companies also, as you, as you would suggest, I think, need to be wary of holding companies or doing business with holding companies in jurisdictions that don't have beneficial ownership registries or which have you know, opaque banking laws or high volumes of non-resident deposits, um, citizenship by investment schemes, uh, so-called golden passports that oligarchs can purchase to, um, to set up their business operations. And in addition, many of the other oligarchs watched the experiences of those we targeted in 2018, like Oleg Deripaska, and have been taking steps to, for instance, get below the 50% threshold uh, uh, for ownership of companies, often by hiding ownership under these holding or shell companies or by parking uh, their assets with close or even distant relatives, wives, sons, daughters. Sometimes, as we've seen with Vladimir Putin, they use completely unrelated third-party intermediaries to hide their wealth. So this can be uh, quite challenging and quite daunting. OFAC's general approach is going to be to expect that companies can demonstrate a commitment to compliance, not that you're going to be perfectly, uh, that you're going to be perfect in every instance, that you will detect every single possible instance where uh, a sanctioned individual might have sort of wormed their way in, but that your compliance shop can document uh, you know, the, the kind of third party due diligence that you've been conducting. Uh, and that people are trained and aware of the different sanctions laws. I'd finish by saying, most importantly, if you have questions, OFAC is, is, is open for the discussion. They run a hotline. They run, uh, uh, they've got a, an email uh, account you can contact them with. And the more information you can provide them, which will be held confidentially, uh, the better they can assess your particular circumstances and perhaps point you to either a general license that applies, or uh, in the event that uh, uh, your enterprise needs some, some level of wind down opportunity or ability to take a little bit of time to undo business, uh, specific licenses sometimes can be issued. But transparency really is the name of the game when it comes to the treasury and US persons, or if secondary sanctions are imposed, which I believe they will have to be, uh, foreign, uh, foreign interlocutors as well. Thank you, Marshall. Um, are there any, um, we we're getting, coming close to the end of, of our session, are there any important guidelines um, to keep in mind when, when walking this fine line between compliance and evasion of sanctions, especially as it relates to perhaps the use of, of third parties? I think the only additional thing that I would mention is that, in fact, one of the most effective measures that is being taken uh, on the Russian Federation are export controls, which are not sanctions in the typical parlance, uh, but we are seeing the effect of export controls on the Russian economy in terms of their ability, for instance, to purchase uh, uh, microprocessors uh, and semiconductors. So what I would tell you is that uh, in addition to the more traditional financial and economic compliance that go with sanctions, uh, companies also need to be aware of the various export control regimes that have been put in place and the restrictions that now apply to different commodities that can no longer be sold into Russia. So if anything, perhaps the, uh, uh, the job jar for compliance shops has gotten substantially larger uh, and, uh, and obviously external advisors can help with those types of things. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. This concludes our discussion for today. Um, I would like to thank everyone for your time and attention. And if anyone would like to have a follow-up discussion with respect to any of the points that we discussed today, 
please feel free to reach out to either me or Marshall directly. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be with you.